last speaker today. My name is Chris Jensen, and I teach at uh, Pratt Institute. I'm going to be talking today a little bit about visualizing cooperation theory in the non-major evolution classroom. Um, when I come to meetings, I often get this. This can either be a look or actually verbalize. Pratt Institute, what is that? Um, so let me tell you a little bit about what I teach. It's kind of a unique place to end up being as a PhD evolutionary biologist ecologist. So it's located in Fort Greene, Clinton Hill neighborhood of Brooklyn, New York, a very hip area, an area of great uh, creative um, energy. And um, we offer a variety of degrees. Um, they're all kind of in the creative fields, so everything ranging from architecture, very large scale built environments, um, to creative writing. Uh, we have some students who are kind of like almost like the philosophers or the, cr the critical study students, uh, philosophers of these subjects. But I'm going to be mostly focusing on design today. And what I want to talk about is how to use design, how I use design to reach uh, art and design students with the hope that maybe they're not the only possible target audience, that design in general can be used to reach our students a little bit better. So I don't know for sure if I'm the only person offering an evolution of cooperation, kind of advanced non-majors course, but it's the only one that I know of. So that's the context of, of where these tools are used. It's a little niche, although I think this could be used in a lot of context, behavioral ecology courses, um, and anywhere where you really want to teach about frequency-dependent selection, because as you'll see, um, one of these tools can be used to talk about social environments and the, how the social environment changes um, what is favored. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the benefits I love, you know, thank you, Mohammed Noor, for saying that we don't all need to be clones of our um, advisors. I am not the clone of my advisor. He's wonderful, but I'm not his clone. And I, my career path is, I think, kind of an interesting example of how you don't have to be a clone. Um, I have a lot of freedom. I mean, I, I just said I want to teach an evolution of cooperation course to non-majors, and they're like, okay. So that's how I got here. Um, why the prisoner's dilemma? Because that's the focus of the tools I'm going to show you today. We also have tool, some uh, other stuff on stag hunt game, um, hawk dove game, and on the ultimatum game, but I'm just going to show you these. The reason is because um, if you go, if you don't know about Prisoner's Dilemma, I can't really tell you about it now, so you'll have to go look it up. But if you actually <laughs> Google Scholar this, which is not the cleanest way to do this, but, but uh, it, well, it's the fastest way, it's not maybe the best. I put in Prisoner's Dilemma and Evolution and Cooperation to see how many hits I get. You get a lot. So you get a lot of articles, 13,800, that are um, using this. Most of them theoretical, which is a whole other story. Um, but the reason that this is important is because this is often the default model um, so the plugins. So people look at space and they look at networking and social environment, all sorts of things. But it, often the default interaction module on in a lot of evolution and cooperation theory is this prisoner's dilemma. So if students are going to understand these larger theories about space and you know uh, amount of populations and other things, they need to understand this basic module. And there's a reason why this module is used. It's because it really captures the conflict between um, individual interests and uh, collective interests. It's, it's kind of the model that's the, the purest form of altruism. Obviously, there's lots of ways of looking at cooperation. Um, so that's the rationale for Prisoner's Dilemma. So what we developed was two teaching tools so far. This is developed with uh, graduate students who are in design fields, so they're not science grad students, they're design grad students. One is the Evolutionary Games Infographic Project. This is a series of free images that are all available on that site there. And the other is the Easy Iterated Prisoner's Dilemma, it's a flash-based activity that you can embed into your classroom, and the, there's the site for that. But they're all available on my website, which stays there, so you won't lose it. Um, so this is the first project, it's the Evolutionary Games Infographic Project. Uh, it was done with Greg Wiesenberg, he's an MFA um, in uh, Communications Design, and now currently a lecturer at Keene University. And what our goal was, was to create this library of graphic images that can be used to teach theme theory related to cooperation. Now, if you know graphic design, a lot of it's advertising, and some people, you know, it's like, it has a lot of branding associated with it, and some of you may be above branding, right? Your science or your teaching is too pure for branding. But I want to make the pitch that branding is really about communicating an idea, and if whether you're selling an idea scientifically or soap, uh, there's some real value in some of the techniques that these folks have. I mean, they, they teach me things that I don't know. Um, so our goal here was to highlight these critical conceptual components of these games using visual design. So I can't show you everything, but I'm going to show you little snippets of this project. So we start off by asking this question whether or not this archetypal story of the prisoner slum is an asset or a liability. Um, you know, the story starts with there's two, two people who have done some crime and they both get separately locked up. And you know, the story has some assets and some liabilities. So some of the assets are is it is very illustrative. The story, when told right, often captures the really critical parts of the game. There's simultaneous decision making by each of the players. 
Um, they don't have a chance to negotiate, so that's kind of valuable. And students in general find stories motivating, and a story helps them to sort of capture the scenario, especially something kind of wonky like game theory. There's some liabilities though as well, and ones that we try to address here was this is told very inconsistently. So if you like look up the prisoner's dilemma, it's told 50 different ways online, and some of them are value, more valuable than others. So not that I want to make a normative or canonical version, but to try to make a version that's kind of clean of some of the mistakes and confusion that comes up in the way the story is told. And it's also, it's a very counterintuitive story. Your goal is to earn payoffs, which is to not get jail time, which is like for very many students, like if it's like a negative, they get confused with the negative and the positive here. So we built an interactive storybook, and we use these two embezzlers, so the white collar crimes criminals, as our model criminals here. And I don't mind to walk you through the whole entire storybook, but what's really important about it is the PDF, and it's interactive PDF. So I don't know if you know how to do this. It's very easy to do. You could do this. This is not high tech stuff. You can embed links in a PDF that jump between parts of the pages. And this essentially turns it into a choose your own adventure. That is dating me. I was born in 1971. So in the 80s, choose your own adventure was a really cool thing. Um, this basically turns the PDF into a choose your own adventure. The students will follow a pathway of their own um, making there. So they like look at this in the first person. They get assigned to be one of the embezzlers here when they do this. And then they have to make decisions in this sort of first person about what they want to do. And they can explore all the options. And they have all the options that their, the opposing player will play. So they get to sort of explore this. Um, and you know, one of the game theory, something like the prison demo is so simple, right? It's the most simple model. But there's, there's complex dynamics that students really need to grapple with. So we also wanted to create a series of images that help them to do this. So this one's actually not uh, here to show you how it helps them understand it, but the later ones do this. But to really show you how we use icons to help them to sort of understand two major parts of this, which is what decision, decision you're making, your strategy, and what are the possible outcomes. So if you look at this image a little more carefully here, um, you sort of see there are these icons here, and you don't have time to look at the whole thing. And it, really, this is more designed to capture some of the cognitive confusion that someone would maybe have when trying to play the game. And later on, they'll actually get to see all of these things. But you know, the, the players are, have to make decisions, and they know the other players making decisions, and there are all these possible consequences. So these images try and capture that. So the whole book goes through all the scenarios, and students can, and can see the full scenarios by going through that. The other thing we wanted to look at is how to represent the prisoner's dilemma itself. This is the typical way of representing it. This is from Wikipedia. And some of the problems with this is that it's very abstract. Um, T R S P. What does that mean? I mean, you know, they have their own names and stories, but they don't jump out at you. I can't look at this and under what, understand what T R S P is. And of course, we're all trained to do that. We're very used to parameters and names like in our head, and we can. No, I'm not that good at it still, but that's what we're supposed to be good at. Um, and you know, this is not very intuitive in the way that it's presented. This one, at least, is color coded. Although, boy, can you see from the back there? It's great. Those little tiny, like red and blue, that really is helpful from the back. Um, so it's not, you know, it's very hard to tell. You have to know that the column players is the first payoff and the row players. So, so there's nothing intuitive about the graphic that really tells you how to interpret it. You have to be told all this meta information. And then it's totally separated from the definition of terms. I mean, to know the, the, the definition of prisoner's dilemma is a relation of these different payoffs, but you have to separate, you separately put that. So we want to make better representations of these um, for students, particularly, again, students have never even heard of game theory. Um, and this is their first introduction to it. So this is one way of representing the flow of the game and the payoff simultaneously in the most simple graphic we could make. We try to, part of the goal here is to simplify things down to just what needs to be communicated here. So as you can see, there is um, a time structure here where there's a before the game, there's the simultaneous choice, and then there are results. Um, students can see this, there's sort of this no, nothing going on at the beginning. There's a simultaneous choice here. And then they, there are these little sort of subway line where we live in New York City. So these are sort of subway line <laughs> influence things that show you how far a student, the uh, players got um, with the results here. So we do use the, the sucker punishment reward and temptation, but we're showing them graphically in the sort of using space as a proxy. And you can talk to students about how those lines could move, but they always need to be relative to each other. So we really broke down the games and tried to create the most simple visual version. This may be more controversial, but we also decided we want to get rid of numbers. So we, we didn't give up these normative forms, these matrix forms, but we want to strip them of their numbers. So we created these forms, and again, these are available for other games like Stag Hunt and um, Hawk Dove. They're color coded, so you can tell which players which by color. They're also shape coded. So redundance of visual information is really critical if you actually count it up. Every piece of information here has two visual signals to them. Um, and uh, then we use non-numerical um, 
representation fill. I guess it's the one thing you have to tell students that the fill represents the payoff. But these are sort of non-numerical um, versions of that. And so you can um, also, if you want, if you, if you really love the TRSP <laughs> thing that is, we have versions of that available too. There's lots of versions of these things. And what I like about these is they allow us to compare um, some critical things. So you can break apart the matrix and then show that individual payoffs completely um, contrast with each other, right? So what's best for the green player is what's worse for the blue player, what's best for the blue player is worse for the green player. So this is sort of the individual version. It's like an important story to tell. You can tell it completely visually here. And then you can say, well, what's the collective story? And you can see that the collective payoff here is the best collective payoff is not the best, it's the second best payoff for each individual. So that's what you want students to get out of the prisoner's dilemma. You can show this completely visually. Really fun to put these next to the stag hunt and the hawk dove, and then the students really understand the difference between these games. So check those out. I don't have them. We also have these other fun visual versions. So this is the version that like captures the outcomes of that little storybook. This is Hofstadter's Douglas Hofstadter's closed bag. It's a closed briefcase exchange. So we have a lot of different images that use kind of real life um, examples here. So that's the, the uh, evolutionary games infographic project, which I hope to continue to expand if you have any suggestions. I'm going to get another grad student assistant and, and expand it. The second project, which may be really valuable to those you have a lab component to your classes or have time to do things in class, it's called the Easy Iterated Prisoner's Dilemma. This was done by Jean Ho Chu, who's a digital artist. He's also an MFA digital artist um, and now a PhD program in Georgia Tech. Um, so the goal of this project was to allow students to set up these uh, Robert Axelrod Iterated Prisoner's Dilemma, Dilemma tournaments. Um, you should. Love the evolution of cooperation. You probably know there's a book called The Evolution of Cooperation by Robert Axel Ross. These are very influential. And again, whether you believe that these tournaments are, are actually valuable for studying evolution, and now they're certainly very historically important, and they're a great setup for students to understand. And so, um, students are going to get to set these tournaments up on their own. And really importantly, they're going to get to visualize the data coming out of these in multiple um, ways. Because that's really critical. Um, and also, just like the other one, this can be um, flashed. You can put it on a thumb drive. You can use it off my website, or you can embed it into an LMS. So it's, it's Apple has not killed Flash yet, and therefore my my tool is still viable. So what's in this Flash-based thing? Again, I can't show you the whole thing, but there's some learn pages. So if you want to use the tool itself to, get, you know, you're not going to students aren't going to learn a ton about it, but the basic background, both historical and the process, and what the proposers done is all in there. So there's learn tabs they can click on. You know, it's very app-like, um, very uh, modern. Um, and, uh, but then more importantly, students can set up tournaments of their own. So this is inquiry-based learning, right? Students inquire, like, what happens if I change the group size? What happens if I change the duration? All these things are, are you know, things that you can actually affect the results with by changing these parameters. Most importantly, they assign players a variety of, of, of different strategies. So we took, we didn't take every strategy under the sun that's ever been played in these iterative prisoner songs. We took some of the more famous early ones that contrast with each other in their approaches. And so there's pull-down menus. You can uh, assign different strategies here, and then you can put your name. So if you really want to make it first-person, students can put their names down here, and they can like play strategies. But more importantly, they can create a diversity of tournaments, including tournaments that have multiple strategies of the same type. So social environment is really critical here. You can test what effect does the social environment have on the outcomes of these tournaments. And if you know these tournaments, then you know that's an important part of the story. Now, Robert Axelrod spent a lot of time in this book breaking down the results here and trying to sort of explain what they mean, and we've tried to do that visually. So you get a grid that gives you the results of each of the tournaments you run. It tells you how many points were earned by um, each of the players and how many they gave up. Those are critical points. And then the grid um, tells you um, who they got points from and who they yielded points to and in what quantity. More importantly, maybe, is, is this network version, which allows students to sort of diagnose where in the game did certain players do really well? Where did they do really poorly? And so it's color coded with the different players. You can sort of see which strategies yielded points, which ones got points. This allows students to get to one of the important con uh, you know, answers here, which is that you can yield more points um, than you earn and still win the game, which is important. And then if you really want to understand each strategy, you need to break down its history against other strategies. So we have a screen in which students can go through the entire history of the game and see how each player got to the point of earning these certain points. Do these tools work? Anecdotally, yes. We like to say in New York City, you know, that in two dollars and twenty-five cents will get you on the subway. The subway costs two dollars and twenty-five cents. Um, so I definitely need other people. I only teach this about once a year and to fifteen students, so I need more people to be involved. And uh, so, if you want to get involved in using these and maybe doing a better study of them with me, that would be great. And uh, thank you to all the people who work on this.
all the time. I will say goodbye. But uh, if anyone wants to ask any questions, come ask questions.